The following is a preview of a chapter from my book. I'm writing a filioque book that will be published within the next two months. There will be a physical copy that you could purchase, but also a free online PDF for anyone to read. In this video, we'll be debunking the Eastern Orthodox doctrine of eternal manifestation. What is eternal manifestation? Well, for the Eastern Orthodox, the phrase through the sun regarding the Holy Spirit's procession can either refer to the eternal manifestation of the Spirit through the sun, which is really distinct from the Spirit's eternal origin, or to the economic procession slash manifestation of the Holy Spirit. The nature of eternal manifestation is unsettled. Some posit that eternal manifestation is identical to the Neopalamite doctrine of energetic procession, while others say eternal manifestation is the distinction between the Spirit existing from or through the Son, but only having existence from the Father. Yet others claim that both refer to eternal manifestation. Regardless of the interpretation one puts forth, what is clear is that eternal manifestation is really distinct from hypostatic origination. As we shall see, the Council of Blackney dogmatized the doctrine of eternal manifestation. The Dogma of Eternal Manifestation the Council of Blackrenae Thomas against Beckos Canon 4 asserts, To the same who affirmed that the Paraclete, which is from the Father, has its existence through the Son and from the Son, and who again proposed as proof the phrase, The Spirit exists through the Son and from the Son, in certain texts of the Fathers, the phrase denotes the Spirit's shining forth and manifestation. Indeed, the very Paraclete shines from and is manifest eternally through the Son. In the same way that light shines forth and is manifest through the intermediary of the sun's rays, it further denotes the bestowing, giving, and sending of the Spirit to us. It does not, however, mean that it subsists through the sun and from the sun, and that it receives its being through him and from him. For this would mean that the Spirit has the Son as cause and source, exactly as it has the Father. From Papadakis, Crisis in Byzantium, page 219. At the Council of Blackrenae, Thomas Kenspeckos, Canon 5, they assert, If, in fact, it is also said by some of the saints that the Spirit proceeds through the Son, what is meant here is the eternal manifestation of the Spirit by the Son, not the purely personal emanation into being of the Spirit, which has its existence from the Father. Otherwise, this would deprive the Father from being the only cause and only source of the divinity. From Papadakis, page 220. So, in the Thomas against Beckos, Canons 4-5, to we see that the phrase, through the Son, either denotes the Spirit shining forth and manifestation, or denotes bestowing, giving, and sending of the Spirit to us. This means that the procession through the Son either refers to internal manifestation that is really distinct from hypostatic procession, or it's regarding a temporal procession of the Spirit. Thesis. Eternal manifestation is nothing other than the hypostatic relations of origin. In the Church Fathers, the eternal manifestation and shining forth of the Spirit refers to the Spirit's hypostatic origin from or through the Son. St. Gregory Nazianzus in Oration 31.9 says the following, But the difference of manifestation, if I may so express myself, or rather of their mutual relations one to another, has caused the difference of their names. Here we have the great St. Gregory the Theologian equating the divine person's manifestation with their mutual relation, which causes the difference of their name. So the manifestation is nothing other than the hypostatic relations of origin, according to this Greek father. The eternal manifestation is not some third category distinct from their hypostatic relations of origin and temporal mission, as the Eastern Orthodox claim. Rather, it's just the hypostatic relations of origin. St. Gregory of Nyssa, in Against Eunomius, Book 1, Chapter 22, says the following, The Holy Spirit, by the uncreatedness of his nature, has contact with the Son and Father, but is distinguished from them by his tokens. His most peculiar characteristic is that he is neither of those things which we contemplate in the Father and the Son, respectively. He is simply neither as ungenerate nor as only begotten. This it is that constitutes his chief peculiarity. Joined to the Father by his uncreatedness, he is disjoined from him again by not being father. United to the Son by the bond of uncreatedness and of deriving his existence from the Supreme, he's parted again from him by the characteristic of not being the only begotten of the Father, and of having been manifested by means of the Son himself. Again, as the creation was affected by the only begotten, in order to secure that the Spirit should not be considered to have something in common with this creation, because of his having been manifested by means of the Son, he is distinguished from it by his unchangeableness and independence of all external goodness. Now the context is about the tokens or hypostatic property of the Holy Spirit. St. Gregory of Nyssa says the Spirit is manifested by the Son. He then says, quote, As a creation was affected by the only begotten, in order to secure that the Spirit should not be considered to have something in common with the creation, because of his having been manifested by means of the Son, he is distinguished from it by his unchangeableness, end quote. So St. Gregory contrasts the Son creating the world to the Spirit being manifested by the Son. The Spirit is not common to creation because of His having been manifested by means of the Son. But the Spirit being different from creation has to do with His divine origin and possession of the divine nature. So the Spirit being manifested by the Son is like St. Gregory Nazianzus said, the Spirit's hypostatic relation of origin from the Son. 
which is why he's distinguished from creation. This is why the Spirit is not the same as creation. While creation is produced ad extra by the Son, the Holy Spirit is hypostatically manifested by the Son insofar as he proceeds from him. St. Gregory of Nyssa in Against Eunomius Book 1, Chapter 36 says the following, I mean the God over all, we turn as it were back again in the race course of the mind, and speed through conjoint and kindred ideas, from the Father through the Son to the Holy Ghost. For once having taken our stand on the comprehension of the ungenerate light, the Father, we perceive that moment from that vantage ground, the light that streams from him, the Son, like the ray coexistent with the Son, whose cause indeed is in the Son, but whose existence is synchronous with the Son, not being a later addition, but appearing at the first sight of the Son itself, or rather, for there is no necessity to be slaves to the similitude, and so give a handle to the critics to use against our teaching by reason in the inadequacy of our image. It will not be a ray of the sun that we shall perceive, but another sun blazing forth as an offspring out of the ungenerate sun, and simultaneously with our conception of the first, and in every way alike him in beauty and power and luster and size and brilliance, in all things at once that we observe in the sun. Then again, we see yet another such light, the Holy Spirit, after the same fashion, sundered by no interval of time, from that offspring light, the sun, and while shining forth by means of it, yet tracing the source of its being to the primal light, the Father, itself nevertheless a light shining in like manner as the one first conceived of, and itself a source of light and doing all that light does. St. Gregory of Nyssa uses the light analogy to comprehend the three divine persons. He calls the Father the ungenerate light, showing forth his personal property of being unbegotten. He then says the Son is a light eternally streaming forth from the ungenerate light, showing the Son is eternally begotten from the Father. Notice that this light analogy is meant to show the personal properties and hypostatic origin of the persons, not an energetic procession. Then when we get to the Holy Spirit, we see, quote, we see yet another such light, the Holy Spirit, after the same fashion sundered by no interview of time, from that offspring light, the Son, and while shining forth by means of it, yet tracing the source of its being to the primal light, the Father, end quote. So the Holy Spirit's personal origin is from the Son, shining forth from him and tracing its being back to the Father. This clearly shows the Son as a hypostatic principle of the Holy Spirit, while maintaining the Father as principle without principle, or first origin of the Spirit. You will notice that St. Gregory of Nyssa uses the term, shining forth by means of it. So the Spirit shines forth by means of the Son, yet this is connected to the Spirit's hypostatic origin from the Son, as he says, such light, the Holy Spirit, after the same fashion, sundered by no interview of time, from that offspring light, the Son. Therefore, according to the mind of St. Gregory of Nyssa, the shining forth of the Spirit from the Son is the same as the Spirit having hypostatic origin from the Son. St. Athanasius in first letter to Serapion says, The Holy Spirit, which is said to proceed, ek pruitai, from the Father, because it is from the Word, who is confessed to be from the Father, that is, shines forth and is sent and is given. The Holy Spirit is said to hypostatically proceed from the Father, insofar as he is from the Word. Clear attestation that the Spirit has hypostatic origin from the Son. Can the Eastern Orthodox affirm that the Holy Spirit is hypostatically from the Father because he's from the Word? No, they can't. Now, St. Athanasius says that this is the same thing as the Spirit shining forth, as immediately after he claims the Spirit is from the Word, he says, that it shines forth. Therefore, the Spirit's eternal manifestation or shining forth is simply his hypostatic origin from the Son. We see St. Athanasius directly contradicts Gregory Sue of Cyprus's separation of manifestation from hypostatic origin. Now let us proceed to debunk both popular interpretations of eternal manifestation. Interpretation 1 of eternal manifestation. The first interpretation of eternal manifestation is that it is the Neopalamite doctrine of energetic procession. The Neopalamite concept of energetic procession is that there is an uncreated divine energy that is really distinct from God's essence that passes from the Father through the Son to the Spirit. Now, if this view of energetic procession is grounded upon the doctrine of the essence energy's real distinction, then a proof demonstrating that the essence energy's real distinction is incompatible with divine simplicity means there is no logical possibility for this version of energetic procession. Therefore, this view of eternal manifestation is incompatible with orthodox dogma. We shall demonstrate that essence energy's real distinction is incompatible with divine simplicity. Therefore, energetic procession can be ruled out. If the essence energy's real distinction is false, then the neo doctrine of energetic procession is false. 2. If essence energy's root distinction is incompatible with divine simplicity, then it is false. 3. Essence energy's root distinction is incompatible with divine simplicity. 4. Therefore, essence energy's root distinction is false. 5. Therefore, the neo energetic procession and eternal manifestation is false. Defense of premise 3. If God's essence is really distinct from God's uncreated energy, either one, the divine energies possess the divine essence, or two, the divine energies lack the divine essence. If option two, then the energy in no way can be called God or uncreated, as it would not be pure act. 
so it would be a mixture of act and potency and be a creature. But if the divine energy is a creature, then the Neopalamite project fails, as they affirm the divine energy is uncreated and is God. If option one, then either A, the energy is separable from the essence, or B, the energy is inseparable from the essence. If option A, you then have multiple separate divinities, so you'd be a polytheist. If option B, then for the energy to be inseparable from the divine essence and be really distinct from it, yet possess it, you'd have to say the divine energy possesses the essence plus some non-essential feature to really distinguish it from the essence. But this would lead to a union of two really distinct parts. Composition simply means that there's a union of two really distinct parts united in one object. Therefore, this interpretation of the essence energy's real distinction leads to composition. So the logical conclusion of the Neopalamite essence energy's real distinction is either polytheism or composition in God. Objection to defense of premise 3. God is not actus purus. This is a neo-scholastic innovation. Therefore, the claim that if the divine energy lacks the divine essence, then it is a creature and a mix of act and potency is false. Therefore, this argument fails. Reply to objection. Does the divine essence have the act of to be? If yes, then God possesses the actuality of essay, or the act of to be. If not, then he is non-being, which is absurd. Every apostolic Christian denies that God has any passive potency. Therefore, if he has the actuality of essay, or the act of to be, with no passive potency, he must be pure actuality. The church fathers would say God's essence is identical to his essay, meaning God is pure act. St. Hilary of Poitiers teaches this in On the Trinity, Book 1, Paragraph 5, where he says, For no property of God which the mind can grasp is more characteristic of him than existence. St. Gregory Nazianzen in Oration 30, Paragraph 18, says, But we are inquiring to a nature whose being is absolute, and not into being bound up with something else, but being is in its proper sense peculiar to God, and belongs to him entirely. St. Augustine in City of God, Book 12, Chapter 2 says, I am that I am, Exodus 3.14. For since God is the supreme existence, that is to say, supremely is, so from esse comes essentia. St. John Chrysostom in Homily 15 on the Gospel of John says, Now the expression I am is significative of being ever, and being without beginning, of being really and absolutely. St. Gregory of Nyssa in Against Anomius, Book 2, Chapter 4 says, Who in the divine appearance to Moses gave himself the name of existent. So it is abundantly clear that the divine essence is esse itself, meaning God possesses the act of to be. If God possesses actuality with no passive potency, then he must be pure act. Therefore, the rejection of God being pure act is contrary to reason and the patristics. Therefore, if the divine energy does not possess the divine essence, then it is not pure act, meaning it's a mixture of act and potency. Anything with passive potency is imperfect, mutable, and dependent, and therefore not uncreated. Therefore, this argument works. Objection to defense of premise 3. An Eastern Orthodox interlocutor might argue that the persons of the Most Holy Trinity are really distinct, but they are not composed, so real distinction does not lead to composition. Reply to objection. Real distinction as real distinction does not necessarily lead to composition. But the claim isn't that real distinction as such leads to composition. Rather, the claim is that the manner of grounding the real distinction for the essence energy's real distinction leads to composition. According to Catholic Trinitarian theology, each person is the divine essence, so there is no real distinction between person and essence. Therefore, this does not lead to composition. The being in of the divine relations is identical to the divine being. Hence, there is no composition, as each person is materially identical to the divine essence. There is a real distinction between the divine persons and each other by way of relative opposition founded upon the divine processions. The being toward of the relations, which constitute the divine persons, is a pure reference of one to the other, such that they are non-identical. This introduces no union of really distinct parts. Therefore, the real distinction of the divine persons by relative opposition does not lead to composition. On the other hand, the Neopalamite believes the energy is divine and really distinct from the divine essence, and possesses the divine essence. So there needs to be a union of essence and some distinguishing feature, really distinct from the divine being, deposit an uncreated energy that is really distinct from the essence. But this leads to a union of two really distinct parts, which means there's composition. So the essence energy's real distinction leads to composition, while Catholic Trinitarian theology does not. Conclusion. We see that the essence energy's real distinction leads to composition or polytheism, so it is blatantly false. This means the Neopalamite doctrine of energetic procession is false. Therefore, if eternal manifestation is the Neopalamite version of energetic procession, then it is a false doctrine that is incompatible with natural reason. Interpretation 2 of Eternal Manifestation The second interpretation of Eternal Manifestation is that it refers to the distinction between the Spirit existing from or through the Son, but only having existence from the Father. 
Here is an argument against this version of eternal manifestation. 1. If there is a real distinction between existence by hypostatic origin and manner of existence, then either the spirit is composed of two different acts of existence or the spirit's act of existence change. 2. The assertion that the spirit exists from or through the Son, but only has existence from the Father, shows the spirit existence by hypostatic origin is really distinct from his manner of existence. 3. Therefore, either the spirit is composed of two different acts of existence or the spirit's act of existence changed. 4. Therefore, this interpretation of eternal manifestation is incompatible with Orthodox Trinitarian theology. Defense of Premise 1 Premise 1 states, If there is a real distinction between existence by hypostatic origin and manner of existence, then either the spirit is composed of two different acts of existence or the Spirit's act of existence change. If the Holy Spirit came into being in a different way than His mode of existence, then there are two routes. 1. The Spirit's coming into being and His mode of existence are simultaneously united within His person. 2. The Spirit's coming to being and His mode of existence are not simultaneously united within His person. If the coming into being and mode of existence are simultaneously united within His person, option 1, then there is a union of an existential coming into being and a really distinct mode of existence in the person of the Holy Spirit. A union of two really distinct existences means there is composition in the person of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, the Holy Spirit would be composed. However, this contradicts divine simplicity in Orthodox Trinitarian theology. Therefore, this is impossible. If the Spirit's coming to being and his mode of existence are not simultaneously united within his person, option two, then there originally was the Spirit's coming to being, then followed by a really distinct mode of existence positing a real change of one state into a second really distinct state in the Holy Spirit. This would mean that the Holy Spirit is mutable. However, the Holy Spirit as God is immutable. Therefore, this is impossible. Defense of Premise 2 Premise 2 states, The assertion that the Spirit exists from or through the Son, but only has existence from the Father, shows the Spirit's hypostatic origin is really distinct from his mode of existence. Eastern Orthodox affirm that eternal manifestation is really distinct from hypostatic procession. Therefore, this premise holds. Defense of Conclusion 3 Conclusion 3 states, Therefore, either the spirit is composed of two different acts of existence, or the spirit's act of existence change. This just follows from premises 1 and 2. Therefore, this interpretation of eternal manifestation is incompatible with Orthodox Trinitarian theology. Furthermore, the Church Fathers will assert that a divine person's hypostatic origin is identical to the divine person's mode of existence, clearly contradicting this interpretation of eternal manifestation that posits a real distinction between the two. Serbian Orthodox Saint Didymus the Blind affirms that a divine person is nothing other than his manner of receiving the divine essence, showing that there is not a distinction between the divine person's manner of existence and hypostatic origin. The divine person's manner of existing is simply his hypostatic origin. Didymus the Blind in the Holy Spirit 163-66 says, The following words of the Lord confirm this opinion. He will glorify me, that is the paraclete, because he will receive from what is mine. John 16-14 Again, receive here ought to be understood in a way that is appropriate to divine nature. Therefore, just as we understood the natures of incorporeals in our discussion above, so too we now ought to acknowledge that the Holy Spirit receives from the Son that which belongs to his own nature. This does not signify that there is a giver and receiver, but one substance, since the Son is said to receive the same things from the Father which belong to his very being. For the Son is nothing other than those things which are given to him by the Father, and the substance of the Holy Spirit is nothing other than that which is given to him by the Son. These statements are made for this reason, so that we may believe that in the Trinity, the nature of the Holy Spirit is the same as that of the Father and the Son." End quote. Didymus says, The Son is nothing other than those things which are given to him by the Father. Showing the Son's manner of existing is simply his hypostatic origin from the Father. Likewise, the Spirit is nothing other than that which is given to him by the Son. Showing the Spirit's manner of existing is merely his hypostatic origin from the Son. So this directly contradicts Gregory II of Cyprus's interpretation of eternal manifestation, which posits a distinction between a person's hypostatic origin and manner of existing. St. John Damascene says the hypostatic properties and the hypostatic processions are simply identical to the person's mode of existence, meaning the son's mode of existence is his generation from the father, and the spirit's mode of existence is simply his procession from the father. Therefore, there is not a real distinction between the manner of existence and the person's hypostatic origin, as the second interpretation of eternal manifestation claims. St. John Damascene in An Exposition of the Orthodox Faith, Book 1, Chapters 8 and 10 says, quote, For no other generation is like to the generation of the Son of God, since no other is Son of God. For though the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father, yet this is not generative in character, but processional. 
This is a different mode of existence, alike incomprehensible and unknown, just as is the generation of the sun. For we recognize one God, but only in the attributes of fatherhood, sonship, and procession, both in respect of cause and effect, and perfection of subsistence, that is, manner of existence, do we perceive difference. While the names Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and causeless and cause, and unbegotten and begotten, and procession, contain the idea of separation, for these terms do not explain his essence, but the mutual relationship and manner of existence." End quote. St. John of Damascus says generation and procession are different modes of existence. Additionally, he says the attributes of fatherhood, sonship, and procession, both in respect of cause and effect, is the manner of existence, where we perceive the distinction of person. So the hypostatic properties are identical to the person's manner of existence. Finally, he says the names Father, Son, and Spirit, and causes and cause, is a manner of existence. We thoroughly see that the hypostatic origin of the divine persons is simply the manner of the person's existence, clearly contradicting Gregory II of Cyprus, who claims a distinction between the hypostatic origin and mode of existence. So this interpretation of eternal manifestation is contrary to patristic thought. Gregory of Nyssa also affirms that a divine person's manner of existing is simply identical to his hypostatic origin. St. Gregory of Nyssa in On Not Three Gods says, quote, But in speaking of cause and of the cause, we do not by these words denote nature, for no one would give the same definition of cause and of nature, but we indicate the difference in manner of existence." End quote. Here, St. Gregory of Nyssa affirms that the relation of cause to that of the cause is simply identical to the divine person's manner of existence. This shows there is no real distinction between hypostatic origin and mode of existence. We have demonstrated that the two most popular interpretations of eternal manifestation are logically impossible and lead to heresy. We have also shown that the patristic understanding of manifestation is intimately connected with the hypostatic relations of origin. Now we shall show that the Eastern Orthodox concept of eternal manifestation, which is really distinct from hypostatic procession, is a made-up doctrine unknown to the earliest opponents of the Filioque, showing it is an innovative doctrine that is not contained in tradition. Thesis. The earliest opponents of the Filioque did not appeal to the doctrine of eternal manifestation when combating pro-Filioque arguments. In fact, some like Photius make assertions that explicitly contradict the doctrine of eternal manifestation. This clearly shows that the Eastern Orthodox conception of eternal manifestation was an innovative interpretation of the Church Fathers made up by Gregory II of Cyprus at the Council of Blackerne to cope with the abundant evidence of the Spirit's hypostatic relation of origin from the Son put forth by Patriarch John Beckus of Constantinople. Example 1. Theodore of Cyrus, 393-458. Theodore of Cyrus was notorious for rejecting the Filioque in his disputes with St. Cyril. St. Cyril, in his ninth anathema against Nestorius, called the spirit the son's own spirit, using the term idios, which refers to a personal characteristic. Theodore objected to this phrase in his counterstatement 9 to St. Cyril's 12 anathemas, and said it could heretically refer to the spirit as being of the son or through the son, both of which Theodore rejects. Now, Theodore concedes that there is one orthodox interpretation of saying the spirit is the son's own spirit. He says, We shall confess that the spirit of the son was his own if he spoke of it as of the same nature and proceeding from the father. So the only orthodox interpretation of the spirit being called the spirit of the son that Theodore knew was that this is referring to mere consubstantiality and procession from the father alone. Notice how he does not explain the spirit being called the spirit of the son by using the doctrine of eternal manifestation or energetic procession. This would be the go-to argument for any modern day Eastern Orthodox interlocutor. Any contemporary Orthodox apologist would claim the spirit is called the spirit of the son because he is manifested by the son, receives energies from the son, or proceeds energetically from the son. However, this line of thought is completely unknown to Theodoret because this innovative doctrine was not yet produced by the fifth century. Example two, Photius. 810 to 893. Photius was the most popular opponent to the Filioque. In his Mystagogy of the Holy Spirit, the most infamous work disputing the Filioque in all of history up into his time, the doctrine of eternal manifestation is mentioned exactly zero times. In fact, when exegeting John 16, Photius claims there is no way the Spirit can be said to receive from the Son. In Mystagogy of the Holy Spirit 21, he says, The Savior did not say, He will receive from me, but He will receive from that which is mine. For he saw and taught the truth to all, in great harmony and unassailable consistency with himself. He will receive from that which is mine. There is great and profound difference between the words, from that which is mine and from me. The expression from me indicates the same person who said the words. But doubtless another person is meant that he who says the words, from that which is mine. What other persons, from whom the Spirit is said to receive, could be meant other than the Father? 
because it cannot be, as has been recently contended against God, that he receives from the Son, and it certainly cannot be from the Spirit, whom himself does the receiving. Notice that this directly contradicts the modern-day Orthodox pneumatology, as many would explain the Spirit receiving from the Son in John 16 by appealing to energetic procession. However, Photius does not bring this explanation up. Rather, he universally rejects any statement of the Spirit receiving from the Son, showing this infamous opponent of the Filioque explicitly contradicts modern-day Eastern Orthodox doctrine of energetic procession. This shows that by the late 9th century, energetic procession and eternal manifestation were completely unknown to the champion of anti-filioque apologetics, once again indicating this is an innovative concept fabricated by Gregory II of Cyprus. Example 3. Anastasius the Librarian, 810-878 Anastasius the Librarian rejected the Son as cause of the Spirit, using the letter to Rhinus, allegedly authored by St. Maximus Confessor. According to Dr. Ed Sachensky, Anastasius the Librarian interpreted the procession of the Spirit through the Son only in reference to the mission of the Spirit. If this referred only to temporal procession, Anastasius' reading of the letter to Marinus would certainly have been amenable to Photis and his followers. If Anastasius was aware of another interpretation of St. Maximus' use of proenai, i.e. the eternal flowing forth or emission of the Spirit, he does not indicate so here. So here we have another opponent of the hypostatic filioque that did not know of energetic procession nor eternal manifestation and only knew of hypostatic and temporal processions. Example 4, the Council of Blackrenae in 1285. When Gregory II of Cyprus presented his Thomas at the Council of Blackrenae, which taught eternal manifestation, he received much backlash from his fellow Byzantines. Many accused him of admitting the same theology as Patriarch John Beckles, showing that they were unaware of this novel eternal manifestation doctrine and took it to be identical to the hypostatic filioque and hypostatic procession per filium. Other more conservative Byzantines rejected the Thomas and asserted that the only relationship between the Son and the Spirit was by temporal procession. What is clear is that the Greek opponents of the filioque were hearing the eternal manifestation doctrine for the first time when Gregory II of Cyprus presented his Thomas, showing this is a made-up doctrine that was crafted to try to undermine the overwhelming evidence that John Beckles presented for the equivalence between the hypostatic filioque and per filium formulas. Why is it that none of the opponents of the filioque up until Gregory II of Cyprus never bring up eternal manifestation? The only explanation is that it is an innovative doctrine not contained in apostolic tradition. Summary. First, we show that the doctrine of eternal manifestation in the Church Fathers is not really distinct from the hypostatic relations of origin. Secondly, we demonstrated that the two most popular interpretations of eternal manifestation lead to heresy. Finally, we showed that the earliest opponents of the filioque had no clue of this doctrine, showing this is the latter innovation. Overall, we have debunked the Eastern Orthodox dogma of eternal manifestation. I dare anyone to attempt to produce even a single Latin saint that explicitly teaches this made-up doctrine. This is impossible and is yet to be done by anyone. I will personally pay $30 to the first person to produce one Latin saint who explicitly teaches an eternal manifestation that is really distinct from the hypostatic procession. If you accept this challenge, contact at Catholic Duong on Twitter. Thank you for watching this video. Have a great solemnity of the Holy Trinity. God bless. Pray the Rosary today. Remember, Vatican II dogmatically teaches that entering and remaining in the church is necessary for salvation. In Lumen Gentium 14, we hear, Whosoever, therefore, knowing that the Catholic Church was made necessary by Christ, would refuse to enter or to remain in it, could not be saved. Therefore, if you want to be saved, become Catholic. For information about becoming Catholic, contact your local Catholic parish and ask them about RCIA or OCIA.